Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, the topic of this webinar is on the current state of BARDA funding. Uh, BARDA is an organization that has gone through a lot of changes, <laughs> has, has uh, honestly, most of the world has gone through a lot of changes. Um, but specifically, BARDA is, is very connected to the pandemic, and they're one of the funding agencies that have really been affected in terms of what their scope of funding is uh, much, much more than any other. Uh, and that's changed multiple times in various different directions. And um, what we're gonna do today is try to uh, get a snapshot of, of what's happening right now at BARDA. So in general uh, today, what we'll be going through is a quick, very high level introduction to who BARDA are. Uh, and then we'll be talking about four different funding routes. The standard BARDA broad agency announcement, which is their primary funding mechanism. Um, we'll be touching on CARBEX, which is a program uh, that BARDA, it's not actually part of BARDA, it's a program that is uh, funded. BARDA is one of the larger funders of, but is not technically part of BARDA. Uh, and they're focused on, on multi-drug resistant bacteria. DRIVE is a division in BARDA that uh, has a slightly different scope than the standard funding opportunities from BARDA and we're going to dive into what's happening there. And finally, we're going to touch on the Joint Program Executive Office for Chemical, Biological, Radiological and Nuclear Defense. And let's, let's dive right in. Um, before we do that, I'll just say, uh, if there are any questions, please feel to type them in and I'll try to address as many of them as I can towards the end. Uh, so, so very quickly, BARDA is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Uh, they are part of the HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and specifically, they report to the ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Uh, they are charged with procurement and development of medical countermeasures against bioterrorism, CBRN, so chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats, pandemic influenza, and emerging diseases. And everybody now knows who BARDA are because of the huge awards they've been giving out, specifically in the emerging diseases or COVID specifically at this in this case, um, uh, space, but they've been a funder for a very long time uh, and, and they cover all of these spaces. Uh, we'll discuss what's happened with them very quickly because unlike most sources of funding uh, that retained most of their funding in terms of funding for the life sciences for R&D activities, you know, the NIH, the NSF, uh, sources like that, a lot of the DOD funding, such as the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs, um, their funding was not really affected by COVID. Uh, a lot of sources like the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, NIAID, received additional funding uh, through the CARES Act to fund a lot of COVID-related activities, but there wasn't really any redirecting of existing funding from other indications into COVID. The exception to that is BARDA, uh, where they basically said, we're pausing everything and we're focusing entirely on COVID. Uh, and understandably so, unlike the other funders, their mission is procurement and development of countermeasures for emerging diseases, which <laughs> is very fitting for them to do so. Um, and that's one of the reasons that basically early in the pandemic, they issued a, an amendment to their BAA and this is maybe a good segue to start talking about their BAA, um, saying essentially any applications you submit that are not around COVID will be put in a queue and we'll get back to, the, to looking at them once the response to COVID is over or at least their involvement in the response and their selection of programs to fund is over. Um, that was the situation in BARDA for a fair amount of time. Uh, in, in, in the interim, they did shift focus in terms of what types of um, solutions for COVID they were looking for in funding. 
there was a transition between therapeutics and then only vaccines, and then there were some therapy types of specifically direct act, direct acting antivirals that they were looking for, and things have changed in terms of their focus throughout the pandemic. Um, obviously, you're aware of some of the incredibly large uh, awards they gave out to some of the developers developing vaccines. And currently what's happening is actually very interesting. Um, they are transitioning out of that mode and transitioning back into funding a lot of the standard spaces they usually fund. Now, they're not quite, that, that transition is not yet complete. Uh, if you look at the last um, amendment to their BAA, the note is still there that any non-COVID applications may be put in a queue. That being said, about a month ago, just over a month during the, uh, the, the, the virtual event they had, the BARDA Industry Day, uh, they talked about the fact that they are now starting to look at that queue and, and look at the non-COVID related applications. So there may be a backlog at the moment and the response time is probably not going to be what they would hope it is and what you may be used to if you've dealt, dealt with BARDA in the past, but they are beginning to open back up to all of the other spaces. And they've actually become very, very specific in any COVID related activities that they're willing to fund. They've pretty much completed in, in, in most angles of, of attacking COVID, they've completed you know, their portfolio of, of, of projects to invest in. Um, and that's really a high level overview of the scenario, but diving in a bit deeper. First of all, if you want to look for the actual solicitation, the best way to find it is just search for BAA 18100SOL 00003. Uh, maybe add BARDA to, to that search, obviously. But generally speaking, uh, this is the quickest way to find the solicitation. Um, and essentially, the process to, to receive BARDA funding, the standard through the standard BAA, uh, ha has four general stages. The first one is actually not mandatory, it's a tech watch. Um, and while it's not mandatory, it's definitely recommended. Um, basically, they're, they're, they're willing to give you feedback before you submit the application in terms of what, you know, how much of a fit this is to what they're looking for. Maybe they would want to see this type of data or that type of data. Uh, this is what they'll be looking for in an application. It's very, very helpful. Uh, there's been, um, best way to put this, I would say, is a feeling in the in the industry, definitely among those who have applied for a COVID-related tech watch or what they've been calling throughout the pandemic a corona watch, um, that they're really not responsive and it takes a, a, an incredible amount of time, uh, if at all you get that tech watch meeting. And that has been true, but that's due to the sheer amount of applications for tech watches and, and maybe rather Corona watches that they were bombarded with. Uh, I believe the number is over 5,000 applications for a meeting. Um, and obviously you have to prepare for each one of these and, and review information and, and it's not something you can just hammer out very easily. So uh, they were completely overwhelmed by that. I think that it's fair to say that. Um, but generally speaking, outside the context of, of the pandemic, it is actually a very user-friendly mechanism. Um, and while, as I mentioned, I think there's probably still going to be a bit of a backlog, it's still very much recommended in terms of improving the chances of actually receiving funding. Um, you can follow the link in the presentation and I will be sending out copies of the presentation to, to anybody who, who registered. So uh, feel no, no need to type it down now. Uh, you'll be receiving this. Um, and they'll basically tell you, you know, sometimes they'll say, listen, it's just not a fit and they'll save you the, the effort. Sometimes they will give you specific feedback and things that you should add or, or work on before you submit something. They'll say, you think this is ready to be submitted. Um, something they did in the context of COVID-19 that they usually don't do in other spaces is tell companies to skip the pre-application, the quad chart and white paper and move to a full proposal. Uh, I would say I wouldn't count on that happening outside the context of Corona. Uh, but generally speaking, the first mandatory step is the quad chart and white paper. Uh, it's what you know other agencies would call a pre-application. It's a shorter form application, but their short form application is is not that short. Uh, it's, it's a couple dozen pages of materials, uh, and 
And generally speaking, this is usually the main cutoff. Not that if you're asked to submit a full application, anything is guaranteed, but much more applications fall off here than at the full proposal stage. Um, and then hopefully it's favorably reviewed. You are invited to submit a full proposal. And upon completing that, which is a pretty hefty document, uh, a few hundred pages, um, everything is scrutinized. And if they like it, uh, they will invite you into the contract negotiations phase, which means it's, it's all but certain you'll be awarded. Uh, the contract negotiations are, it's not your standard negotiation. It's not necessarily about money. It can be about, you know, how to structure the project and that could affect the financial aspects as well. Um, but also it's about, you know, how the c communication between the company and Barda will, 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 will work throughout the process, what, you know, milestones there'll be, what they'll be looking for in terms of actual um, measurables. And, and it, it's about defining how the actual project would, will work uh, in, many, in many respects. Um, a few things to mention in, with regards to the standard main barter mechanism, and we're going to dive in, in a minute into the topics that are currently open. Uh, but first of all, there's potential for very significant awards. Now, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, half a billion dollars, <laughs> as you may have seen, uh, is a realistic number because it is definitely not. Um, but their awards on average tend to be, you know, tens of millions of dollars. They are very large awards. Um, the, the, I think the the smallest award we've helped a client secure with Barda is probably about ten million dollars, and the largest one last year was almost eighty. Uh, and, and they the, some larger ones exist. Um, and this is pre-COVID. Um, technology readiness levels or TRLs are generally advanced, meaning they will typically fund projects, and this is a generalization, you should definitely look at their solicitation uh, with regards to the specific area of interests that you would be submitting for, because they always define exactly what the technology readiness level that is required for that specific AOI, and it does vary between the different areas of interest. But generally speaking, it tends to be relatively advanced. They're not you know, known to fund early stage projects. Generally, as a rule of thumb, I would say clinical activities, early clinical, but clinical activities is where typically they'll start uh, with exceptions. And as I mentioned, the best thing to do is just to look at what is relevant for your area of interest. Um, and diving into the specific areas of interest, and I'm not going to go in detail through everything. There's just too much. But in general, they're very specific right now with vaccines. Specifically, you know, uh, Sudan Ebola virus and Marburg, and then vaccines for antimicrobial resistant threats, um, CBRN antitoxins and therapeutic proteins for anthrax and, and botulism in terms of antitoxins and smallpox and, and various hemorrhagic fevers in terms of antivirals. Again, very specific. And again, this is not quite specific enough. If one of these spaces is a fit for you, go through the solicitation, look at exactly what they're looking for, exactly what stage of development you need to be at to apply. But these are in general, what they're focused on funding at this point moving forward. Antibacterials could be post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, drugs and various non-traditional therapeutics. Um, in terms of radiological and nuclear threats, it could be treatments for radiation injury, blood products, decorporation agents, and enabling technologies. And in terms of chemical threats, um, anything that would address exposure to pulmonary agents, uh, exposure to opioids, and, and the respiratory failure that typically follows that, uh, an opioid overdose, obviously. It's, this is not funding for development of opioids or alternatives to opioids. The, the, the context here is chemical threats, I and mean, opioids as a chemical threat, to be clear. Uh, various different types of agents and novel delivery methods. Again, delivery methods in the context of chemical threats and, 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 and countermeasures rather to those chemical threats. 
Um, burns, uh, lots of different approaches to burns. Um, non autologous product to prevent or reduce burn wound conversion, uh, wound closure, uh, temporizing burns, uh, countermeasures for cutaneous radiation injuries, and treatment of pulmonary inhalation and blast related injuries. All of those types of burns um, are relevant. And it's actually one of the spaces they have one of the most broad areas of interest of, of them all. Uh, emerging diseases diagnostics. And this is one of the only areas as part of their BAA that are open still to COVID related projects. And I would very much encourage you if one of these points seems to be a fit to go read the fine print because it's actually much more specific than what I'm able to convey here. Um, diagnostic assays for human coronaviruses, plural, meaning differentiation typically between the various different types of coronaviruses as well, using existing FDA cleared platforms. And then maybe that's a good example of some of how specific the things they're, they're still looking for in the, in the COVID space are. It has to be able to differentiate between the different types of coronaviruses and be based on an FDA cleared existing platform. So that's a very specific requirement or set of requirements, obviously. Point of care diagnostic assays for detection of SARS-CoV. Point of care in this context typically would mean something that's handheld, very easy to, to mobilize. Uh, diagnostic assays for detection of COVID disease, including serology tests, diagnostic assays for SARS-CoV, to as part of FDA cleared panel for influenza and other respiratory viruses using FDA cleared pet platforms. Again, a lot of specificity here. Uh, and basically what I'm trying to say more than anything else is if this is, it sounds similar to something you're trying to develop, by all means um, search for uh, the, the solicitation as I uh, mentioned earlier and just make sure it really is a fit because the remaining requirements are, are very specific. Um, so another topic or area of interest that's uh, open at this point in time is influenza and emerging infectious disease vaccines. Uh, specifically in terms of infectious diseases, this is for non-COVID infectious diseases. They had a, a separate AOE for COVID vaccines and it has been closed. So they do not specifically state in the solicitation, I added the non-COVID. They did not specifically state that this is for non-COVID infectious diseases, but if you try to submit COVID through this AOI, it will not be considered responsive and they will disqualify it without reviewing it. Um, so they're looking for, in this context, advanced development of more effective vaccines and innovative vaccine production enhancements. Uh, influenza and emerging infectious disease therapeutics, on the other hand, in, co in, in, in uh, contrast to what I just said about the, uh, the vaccines, COVID therapeutics are still included. Um, they are again, relatively specific in what they're looking for. Um, they, they have various different things, different angles and, and, and specifications, a bit too much uh, than, than I would really prefer to go into in detail because it's, you know, it's a few pages of specifications. Uh, but again, for COVID therapeutics, in terms of the stage of development and the type of approach, you're definitely encouraged to go uh, and check out the, the actual solicitation. Um, the last amendment was issued just a few days ago, I believe, on November 27th. So it should be relatively easy to find. Um, and finally, innovative approaches to improve clinical trial execution for hospitalized influenza patients. Uh, and one final relatively recent addition is advanced manufacturing technology as well. So BART are now interesting, is interested in, in manufacturing technologies and will fund that. Um, the next source of funding uh, that we'll discuss in, in the specific context of BARDA uh, is CARBEX. And, and to be fair, CARBEX, we're not going to review their open solicitations because unfortunately they do not have any. And that's maybe part of the update I'm trying to provide. CARBEX has been since 2016, um, a private, uh, public-private partnership that has funded a very significant amount 
of companies uh, in the space of multi-drug resistant bacteria and, and in general, um, this new emerging threat of a lack of, of adequate treatments for various types of bugs. And currently, basically what they said uh, at the BARDA Industry Day was that 2021 may be a transition year. Usually they had three or four deadlines a year. They announced in advance and each deadline actually had a slightly different um, topic or type of technology they were looking for in the various different deadlines. It doesn't look like there's going to be anything announced in the near future and there are, no, there are currently no open deadlines. Um, they mentioned, as, I'm, as, as I stated earlier, 2021 may be a transition year. Uh, and, and when they say transition, in, in, they have a pretty extensive portfolio at this point in time. As I mentioned, they've been doing this since 2016. Uh, and looking forward, CARBEX was specifically referenced in the recently published National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria. This is the plan for 2020 to 2025. Uh, and actually, CARBEX was formed in part based on the previous uh, action, national action plan that was issued five years ago in 2015. Um, as, as this timeline indicates here, in 2015, there was the first national action plan. In 2016, the first agencies uh, started funding uh, CARB activities, meaning combating antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Uh, and now in 2020, and 2020 may be a bit uh, misleading, uh, this action plan came out late October. So we're talking about about a month ago. This is very new. Um, and if you look at objective two and specifically objective 2.1, uh, one of those is to award 100 new projects, uh, grants, contracts, and CARB-X awards specifically aimed at therapeutic discovery or development by 2024. So definitely the goal is to continue CARB-X funding but currently there's nothing open. And that really more than anything else is, is the update on CARBEX. Um, DRIVE, DRIVE is the Division of Research, Innovation and Ventures. Um, the point of DRIVE is kind of fast tracked awards that you can receive very, very quickly as it says here up to between one and three months. And then uh, they're, they're, very, they're very proud and, and um, they make a point of how quickly they make the awards. Usually when they announce an award, they'll say how many days, in days, it took from submission to award. Um, and the way in general it works is you have to match 30 to 50% of the money you're receiving and of the award, of the total cost of the project, excuse me. And, and uh, their participation is up to 750,000. So it's, it's definitely smaller, it's very quick. Uh, it's in many cases for earlier stage projects. In, in the specific case of COVID, in many cases, they're also looking for advanced things, but usually, and definitely before COVID, DRIVE was primarily for things that are a bit too early for your standard BARDA grant uh, or contract. And, and maybe to, to elucidate a little bit more about the financial aspects, um, they will participate and provide up to $750,000, the total, and, and you should be able to provide 30 to 50% of the total cost. So as an example, if it's 50% of the total costs and they're providing 750, the total budget you're um, submitting to them would be one point, up to 1.5 million, and, and they would provide half of that. So, but it could be also them providing 750 and, and the total cost be 120, basically the 1.2 million, excuse me. Essentially, these are the two requirements, as I mentioned, you bring 30 to 50% of the money, they provide up to 750,000. That's essentially how it works. Um, very, very quick. And this is the flow chart in terms of what the process actually looks like. Um, the market research call with the program manager is in many ways similar to a tech watch. It's just a lot, uh, easier to set up and it's, it's it definitely in, in comparison to what's been happening happening with COVID. Um, quick call just to, to go over things, make sure it's relevant and then you submit an abstract. The abstract is I believe 2000 words. So it's probably about, excuse me, 200, sorry. Uh, it, not very long, uh, two and a half pages on average, obviously, with some variation. 
and essentially, if they're interested, there'll be discussion. You also be a statement of work, statement of work, uh, uh, the cost and technical information. But honestly, that discussion is, if they've asked you for that, it's almost certain you'll be receiving the award. That's how quick it is. Based on the abstract, they make an almost definitive solution. Uh, so, so it's incredibly quick. Um, as they illustrate here, 30 to 120 days from the day you submit till you receive the award, which is really unheard of in terms of grants. Um, and, and, and there have been awards we've seen that, that, are, that are at the er, earlier end of that spectrum. So we've seen awards in, in, in around 30 days, uh, time to money from, you know, you, you submit three pages and a month later you receive a significant amount of money. That's, that's not something that's typical for a grant at all. Um, in terms of what Drive actually covers, so, so the, this has also changed with regards to COVID and, and the response. And, and um, currently, the situation is this. There are four open areas of interest, uh, early notification to act, control and treat, enact, uh, infection severity and solving sepsis, repurposing drugs in response to chemical threats, and beyond the needle. Um, Enact basically is for wearables and other sensing technologies. Uh, they should be able to identify and characterize signatures that signal either infection or, or injury before the actual onset of the noticeable symptoms. Uh, and also provide early health status information to medical care providers. Uh, so a lot of wearables, sensors, things like that. Um, and they specifically state that applications may but do not have to focus on COVID-19 as a potential use case. Uh, the second area of interest is infection severity and solving sepsis, uh, host-based diagnostic monitoring devices, predictive analytics tool, uh, host-targeted therapeutics and clinical management approaches. And app again, applications may not, may, may, excuse me, but do not have to focus on COVID-19. And it's important to mention here uh, with regards to the infection severity, that was actually a recent addition. It used to be just solving sepsis, and the infection severity is probably we, we, we our our understanding is the infection severity is focused to a significant degree on on, on the COVID use case. So anything that will be able to um, monitor or diagnose or predict the severity of an infection would be of a lot of interest to them in this context. Um, this is a very specific one, repur repurposing drugs in response to chemical threats. Uh, they're basically looking for projects that repurposing, that repurpose, excuse me, existing therapeutics as a countermeasure for various chemical threats. Uh, and the requirements are basically, it has to be either approved or a late stage clinical uh, asset. Uh, and it should be in an, an indication that has similar symptoms to the exposure to that chemical agent that, that it's going to serve as a countermeasure for. So it's very specific. Uh, and also should utilize improved delivery routes or mechanisms to provide ease of administration to large numbers of exposed individuals during mass casualty situations. So essentially repurposing an existing drug for something that has similar symptoms to the exposure to a chemical agent and has you know improved delivery routes that will allow it to be distributed easily during mass casualty situations that's very specific but if you have something like that by all means um beyond the needle is is a very recent addition uh to their aois and, and it's essentially uh novel administration technologies that a utilize alternative routes of administration uh, to administer therapeutics, uh, such as oral, intranasal, transdermal patches, sublingual or buccal uh, mechanisms of, of administration that involve simplified logistics and, and enable easier deployment and uptake and are able to be administered without trained healthcare professionals. Um, so if you have a technology that could be a fit for that, a very good fit for drive again. Uh, these are the current focus areas. As I mentioned, it has been dynamic uh, just it, as uh, the standard BAA has been, um, but uh, a fantastic funding opportunity in the sense that it's 
the turnaround time is is not similar to anything I'm familiar with, um, government or private foundation funding for that matter. Um, and the last topic I wanted to touch on today uh, is something called the Joint Program Executive Office for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Defense. This is actually under the Department of Defense and not under BARDA, to be clear. Um, the reason I'm talking about this as part of a BARDA webinar is throughout the pandemic, they have been working together a lot. Uh, BARDA has undergone a lot of changes, both in terms of uh, BARDA's high-ranking officials and in terms of their priorities and the involvement of the DOD has uh, been a gradual, it's been increasing gradually throughout, throughout the pandemic as well. Um, so, so what the end result of the structure of BARDA will be, it's, it's to a certain extent hard to say, but I'll put it this way. Uh, the representatives of the JPEO, CBR, and D are sitting on every single tech watch that BARDA does at this point in time, and have been for quite some time. Um, and they have their own funding. Um, they are in many respects similar to BARDA, but they are part of the DOD and they're not there to safeguard the entire population. They're taking care of the men and women in uniform. Um, and, and really they, the challenge is they have no open solicitations uh, because the DOD is never simple, uh, but the best ways to approach them are really twofold, we've found. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, they're on the BARDA tech watch. So if you set up a BARDA tech watch, they will be there. And we've seen cases where they saw a technology on a tech watch that was interesting for the military, and they just moved forward, it took it over to, the, to their side of things and moved forward with it. And, and then they, the client either received or didn't receive funding, but th they went through the process with the JPEO, CBR, and D, and not with BARDA, um, or with both sometimes. Um, and the second way to contact them is just directly through this email that I've added here. In, fan, in standard DOD fashion, it's a very simple, short, concise email, uh, which is, um, I'm not even going to try to read that, but it is here, and as I mentioned, you'll be receiving the slides. Um, so hopefully I've been able to provide a quick uh, snapshot of what is ha happening right now with BARDA. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in BARDA, uh, as I mentioned, and there's no way to ensure that this will be true very far in the future. But at least for now, I think this is a pretty accurate snapshot of, of what they're interested in and, and what the situation is. I think one of the main take home messages I would like to convey is that they're transitioning out of the period where they were exclusively funding COVID, but there's probably going to be a significant backlog because they put everything they received that was not COVID in queue and they are going to deal with all of that. So I wouldn't expect timely responses quite yet on the non-COVID applications. Um, I've been Jonathan Adelist, Head of Business Development for the Freemind Group. Uh, we are, I haven't mentioned, but just very quickly, we're a, a consultancy that assists clients in raising money from really any type of government source uh, and, and private foundations, any type of non-dilutive source in general. Uh, and, and a couple notes towards the end. Uh, well, first of all, next week, December 8th at 11 a.m. Eastern time, uh, and we will send a link. Uh, we have a, a webinar with Dr. Mike Pick from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the NHLBI. Uh, the topic will be the, their Catalyze program, which is a new initiative uh, specifically for, for uh, funding um, transition and translation of, of discovery into viable therapeutics and diagnostics, obviously within the, the space that they're charged with, which is you know, heart, lung, and blood. Um, I think that'll be very interesting. Uh, and, and a second note, uh, January 13th, we will have our non-dilutive funding summit. Typically that's uh, during JP Morgan week in San Francisco. This year it will obviously be virtual, but still during JP Morgan week, January 13th, we'll have lectures there from uh, BARDA, NIAD, NIDDK, National Institute on Aging, NCATS, NIBIB, NHLBI again, um, 
Lots of funders will be speaking at the event. I think it'll be very interesting. It's a free event. Uh, you do have to register to attend it, but it's it, there's no charge. Uh, and it starts 9 a.m. Eastern up until 3 p.m. There'll be two tracks. Uh, and anybody interested will be sending out the information, but also feel free to either contact me directly or, or go on our website. It's, it's, it's available in all of those places. And I will try to touch on a few questions here if we have time. Um, let me see here. So there are, are, are some very, very specific questions that I'd rather answer over email. Some questions regarding, will I cover a topic that I did uh, in fact cover? So obviously the answer to that is yes. Um, With regards to what, who the right program officer to contact with regards to any of the specific areas of interest uh, with DRIVE, uh, look at the DRIVE broad agency announcement, their actual solicitation. If you Google DRIVE BARDA BAA, you'll find it momentarily. Uh, and at the end of the summary of each area of interest, there'll be contact information for the relevant program officer. So that's, that's uh, I think, important. And there's one question that came in just right now uh, with regards to the webinar next week. Uh, we will be sending out to all of the uh, registrants a link to, to register for next year's web, uh, next, yeah, next year. Well, hopefully that too, but, but next week's webinar. Uh, so I think that covers it. Thank you all for attending. Uh, and feel free to reach me at this uh, email if you have any further questions. Uh, and uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much.